on January 17, 2014, officers entered the house of 52-year-old Harold Sasko and discovered his bloody body. During the investigation, it turned out that an 18-year-old girl was living with him, who everyone thought was his stepdaughter, but she was not at the scene. When the officers found out what had happened in that house, the entire community was in shock. Sarah McLean was born on July 9, 1994. She grew up in Topeka, the capital of Kansas in the USA. For several years of her upbringing, she did not attend school and was homeschooled. Sarah grew up as a naive and shy child, but at the same time very friendly and attentive. She had a younger brother whom she always took care of and an older sister with whom she was very close. When Sarah was still a child, a neighbor began to abuse her, leading to severe trauma that affected her life. The girl started having nightmares in which she relived the violence and woke up in the middle of the night in panic. Stress and fear did not allow her to live in peace. Then Sarah started running away and drinking alcohol. Because of this, her parents decided to take her to a psychologist to help her process the trauma. However, the situation did not improve, and things at home got worse. Around this time, her parents divorced, which had a significant impact on her. According to Sarah, her parents' divorce made her feel unloved at home. Over time, she completely lost contact with her father, and her relationship with her mother became increasingly conflict-ridden. Sarah felt out of place at home and wanted to leave as soon as possible. She apparently needed a job to leave home. At the age of 14, Sarah started working in a pizzeria. The owner of this establishment was a middle-aged man named Harold Saska. At first glance, Harold was a successful and upright person. At that time, he owned three pizzerias and was a devout Christian. But his employees had a different version. They said Harold was a pervert. One of Terry David's employees, the manager of one of the establishments, said Harold asked him to hire only young, attractive girls. Apparently, Terry didn't like this, and every time he hired a girl, he warned her to be cautious of her boss. But when Sarah was hired and received this warning from Terry, she was very naive and concluded that the guy was exaggerating. When the girl started working at the pizzeria, Harold began communicating with her and gradually gained her trust. He even picked her up from school, drove her to work, bought her things, asked her to tell him what was happening, and even told her to see him as a father. But he also told her not to tell her mother about what was happening. So Sarah listened to him, and her family never found out about this relationship. Parallel to her relationship with Harold, whom she began to see as a father, Sarah experienced another rape at the age of 16, this time by a close friend. According to the girl, they were relaxing when her friend pushed her onto a table, the table broke, and he raped her and even burned her back with a cigarette. All of this obviously affected Sarah, who, thanks to psychotherapy, had already managed to cope with the violence she had been exposed to as a child. But with this new episode, the ghosts of the past returned to her life. Sarah returned to psychotherapy, and this time she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The situation quickly spiraled out of control. Stress and depression increased to the point that the teenager attempted suicide. Sarah was then hospitalized in a psychiatric clinic for some time, where she received therapy and medication for rehabilitation. When Sarah left the hospital, she continued to take medication and see a psychologist. It began to help her cope with everything she had gone through. However, the situation at home was very tense, and she couldn't stand the atmosphere there. When the girl was hospitalized, she no longer worked at Harold's Pizzeria, but they stayed in touch. He picked her up from school, took her to lunch, and asked about her life. A 50-year-old man saw an opportunity when Sarah was very vulnerable and decided to take advantage of it. During this time in Sarah's life, Harold repeatedly suggested she move in with him. He was single, had no children or obligations, 
and lived alone. Besides, his business was going very well, and he told the girl that he could help her financially. Harold even offered to finance her education. But Sarah repeatedly refused. She didn't want to move in with Harold, even though she desperately wanted to leave home because the arguments with her mother were daily and often very intense. Finally, in 2012, when she graduated from school and turned 17, Sarah accepted Harold's offer and moved in with him. Then it seemed to her that this was the beginning of a new life and that with this person she would have everything she needed. And indeed, Harold was initially like that. He bought Sarah everything she needed, enrolled her in college, provided her with food, a roof over her head, and asked for nothing in return. He bought her gifts and was very attentive to what she needed and wanted. But when Sarah turned 18, everything changed. At that point, Harold began making inappropriate propositions to her. He invited Sarah to have sex in return for everything he did for her, which she obviously refused. In the months she lived with Harold, they pretended to be stepfather and stepdaughter to avoid misunderstandings and misinterpretations of their relationship. Sarah never thought this man would ask her to have sex with him. According to the girl's mother, she was never okay with her daughter moving in with Harold, but Sarah never listened to her. Several people close to Harold and Sarah said she even called him dad, and the fact that he asked her for intimacy surprised them greatly. When Sarah refused, the man became very angry. He hinted that there would be no home for her if she didn't have sex with him. Harold also knew that Sarah had problems in the past and had already started consuming alcohol and illegal substances at a very young age. The man took advantage of this and offered her various forbidden substances. When Sarah was under the influence of drugs, Harold tried to have sex with her and even raped her several times. Every time the girl refused, the man became angrier, more aggressive, and crueler towards her. Then Harold wrote Sarah a list of all the things he had bought her and explained that she couldn't leave the house until she repaid all the money. He manipulated her by threatening to sue her for not paying her debts if she tried to run away. By this time, Sarah had a steady job, but Harold withheld her pay, and her income wasn't enough to cover everything Harold demanded. The expenses included two expensive cosmetic surgeries that Sarah underwent at Harold's urging. One was a nose job, and the other was buttock implants. The second surgery caused her such pain that she took medication for several months. For these two surgeries, Harold demanded $16,000 from Sarah. In addition to all these payments for gifts, the man also demanded payment from the girl for the months she lived in his house. Sarah couldn't return home to her mother because Harold subjected her to psychological violence and manipulated her by saying that no one needed her at home and that she would definitely not be accepted there. Her behavior completely changed from a quiet, naive girl with a very good heart to a very aggressive girl who didn't want to talk to anyone and defended herself at the slightest remark. According to Sarah, over time, her thoughts changed, and she began to feel the desire to kill. First, she went to a pet store and bought rabbits. When she got home, she killed them with a knife, skinned them, and then ate them. Harold witnessed all of this but said nothing to her. Moreover, he laughed at her. When Sarah wasn't at work, she was always under the influence of illegal substances, alcohol, or in a very bad mood because of everything she had gone through at Harold's house. Eventually, Sarah started taking antidepressants because she thought they might help her. Weeks passed, and they had no effect, so she switched to stronger ones, but they didn't help either. This plunged the girl into a spiral of self-destruction, and it was only a matter of time before something terrible happened in that house. On January 17, 2014, police officers arrived at Harold's house. His colleagues reported him missing after he didn't show up at the pizzeria for several days and couldn't be reached. The officers rang the doorbell several times, but no one answered. Then they decided to look through the windows to see if there was anything inside. 
One of them managed to see a man's body in a pool of blood, and the officers broke down the door to enter the house. When they entered, they found several empty beer cans next to Harold's body. Harold's body was taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy, and it was determined that he died from multiple stab wounds to the neck. Additionally, an analysis of the beer cans was conducted, and traces of sleeping pills were found in them. The police knew that Sarah lived with Harold in the house, and when they arrived, they found her phone and, knowing her age, concluded that she was missing. They thought someone might have taken the girl against her will. Later, the officers learned that Sarah had called work and said she would be absent for several days due to the death of a relative. They spoke with the girl's family, and her mother said that Sarah had tried to contact her grandmother. The police traced the calls and found that they had been made from different grocery stores. After investigating where these stores were located, they concluded that Sarah was traveling from Kansas to Texas. They also checked the surveillance footage of the stores and found that it was indeed Sarah who called and that she was alone. At that moment, it became clear to them that she had not been kidnapped and she became the main suspect in Harold's murder. On January 25, 2014, 11 days after the murder, the 19-year-old Sarah was found sleeping in Harold's car by a park ranger. This happened around 1.30 a.m. in Everglades National Park. When they woke her up to arrest her, they found that she had a loaded weapon. A search of the car revealed another gun, illegal substances, an axe, and two knives. At the time of her arrest, Sarah was not taken to Kansas but left in Florida where she was interrogated by several investigators. The girl did not resist and did not try to make up a story. She quickly admitted that she had indeed killed Harold and fled the scene. Sarah said that this man had been harassing her and that she saw this as the only way to get rid of him. The girl told everything in detail. According to her, a few days before the incident, when Harold was not home, she went to the pharmacy and bought a pack of sleeping pills. On January 14, the day before the man's body was discovered, she had a day off. Harold started renovating the house and asked Sarah to bring him a beer. The girl said that at that moment she realized this was her chance. She knew that Harold would not only drink beer but would also want more. After the third can of beer, Sarah started mixing the pills into Harold's drink. She said she waited until the third can so he wouldn't notice the strange taste. While Harold asked for more beer, she continued giving him the pills, totaling five. This medication, combined with alcohol, caused Harold to lose consciousness. Then, Sarah quickly tied his hands and feet. According to her, Harold woke up at some point for about a minute and mumbled something. Sarah didn't understand him well but said she felt very sorry for him at that moment but was determined to carry out her plan. She took out a knife and stabbed him several times in the neck, almost decapitating him. When the girl realized that Harold was dead, she took his blood and wrote the word freedom on the bathroom wall. Then, Sarah washed her hands, took a shower, changed clothes, and took money, a tablet, and Harold's car and left the house. She said she left her phone behind so it couldn't be tracked and believed that something had happened to her as well. The girl drove towards Texas, but when she arrived, she didn't like it there because it was too cold at night, so she drove to Florida. Along the way, Sarah mostly slept in the car and stopped on the highway to rest. When she arrived in Florida, she contacted a local tattoo artist, James Baker, to get a tattoo. This wasn't Sarah's first tattoo, she already had the phrase, only God can judge me, on her shoulder. For her second tattoo, Sarah chose a quote from a book, Beware of the dark pit at the bottom of our hearts, in its icy black depths live strange perverse creatures that are best left alone. Sarah hoped that by cooperating with the police and telling the whole story of Harold's violence, they would be lenient and reduce her sentence. However, the police decided not to do so. They portrayed Sarah as a real psychopath and Harold as a calm Catholic who only wanted to help the girl. 
During the interrogation, Sarah told one of the officers that during the fits of rage she experienced in Harold's house, she felt the urge to kill. Therefore, the prosecutors claimed that Sarah killed Harold because she wanted to know what it felt like to kill a man and not because he was cruel to her. The police also found a message on Sarah's phone in which Harold apologized to her for forcing her to have sex with him, but none of this was shown to the jury in the first trial. All evidence of Harold's abuse of Sarah was ignored to bring the girl to trial. In February 2014, the trial against Sarah began. The lawyer did not want to use all of Harold's abuses against the girl as they were not considered in the indictment. He decided to try another risky strategy. The man suggested to Sarah to prove her innocence due to a mental illness, claiming she suffered from dissociative identity disorder. According to Sarah, the lawyer told her that she would be released this way. According to the defense, Sarah developed several alter egos to cope with the abuse she endured. One of these personalities was Vanessa a fragile and vulnerable girl who was afraid of dying to escape Harold. But another personality named Lisa, who was very bad, decided to kill the man to prevent this. Then there was Mila, who had deep memories of abuse. The lawyer argued that all these personalities represented the so-called system and that the real Sarah disappeared when she was raped by a friend. Sarah expressed remorse for her actions and apologized to Harold's family but her defense strategy was unsuccessful. Neither the judge nor the jury believed a single word. The prosecution had another carefully crafted story. They focused on the fact that Sarah killed Harold just to find out what it was like to kill a person. They stated that the sexual relations, despite Harold's pressure, were consensual and not part of the violence. Since the defense had already addressed the issue of trauma and what Sarah had experienced, the prosecution declared that all these episodes from the past were not true, not considering the fact that Sarah had undergone psychological treatment related to everything she had gone through. They continued to portray Harold as a calm religious man who only wanted to help a misguided teenager, whom she took advantage of. The prosecutors even stated that the illegal substances were not brought home by Harold but were bought by Sarah herself, although there was no evidence of this. The only thing they could prove 100% was that Sarah had already planned Harold's murder. When they checked her phone, they found several messages to her sister saying she had already found a way to get rid of this person forever. This made the prosecution clear to the judge that the crime was premeditated, and they therefore demanded a first-degree murder conviction. To further confirm this hypothesis, Sarah's browser history was checked, revealing that she had been researching the vulnerabilities of the neck and methods of attacking a person for a month. On September 4, 2015, 21-year-old Sarah was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 50 years. After the verdict, all information about Harold's abuse and the witnesses that the prosecution did not allow was made known to the media, and the case attracted great attention. It was found that most information about the conditions of the relationship between Sarah and Harold was hidden from the jury for unknown reasons either to preserve Harold's image as a quiet religious man in the eyes of many or because the prosecution simply wanted to achieve the harshest possible punishment for the girl. However, in the end, all of this attracted more and more public attention. In 2021, Sarah made a deal with the prosecutor, which managed to reduce her sentence from 50 to 25 years. The girl is still sentenced to life imprisonment but can apply for release after 25 years.